And uh, my wife would hate that because we're arguing and then all of a sudden pff, I check out, I'm gone. And I realized that was something that like, as Kevin called it, like trauma that happened from being molested because you can't really run away. These two older boys got you. So I had to mentally check out. I'm like, you know what? I never once in my life sat on the floor and played anything with my father ever, never one time. The only catch we ever had was him coming home drunk from work and throwing a steel toe boot at me and me having to dodge it. Right. So I got some good skills out of it. I got quick and I, I could got a good crossover in basketball from <laughs> dodging the steel toe boots. But I realized I was just a fucking ghost my entire life. Just confused and lost. Didn't have a whole lot of direction at home and family. Just taxed Sunday afternoon, got in a car accident and someone died. And it was it was my fault. So, uh, Steve, how would you describe the project? Like, what is the project? Because you're one of the instructors. Before we dive deep into what you do, what is the project? I describe it as something for men, people who men who know there's more than what they have to offer. They're not living to their full potential, and they know it. They just have been probably not admitting it for a long time. Your mom was a U.S. citizen. Mom was a U.S. citizen. Dad is Filipino. My mom was out traveling the world and ended up in the Philippines. Totally randomly, my dad was a photographer. She was like the only white woman in the islands. And boom. Hot commodity right there. Yeah. 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 But your full name is not Aaron Alejandriano. No. It is? Full name is Aaron Nara, Juan Miguel, John Michael, Turner, Luke, Kelly Cruz, Alejandrino. And on that note, I want to welcome you to the BK Strength Show. This is the show where we talk about physical strength, emotional strength, and mental toughness. And today I've got two very special people here. Our dear friend Aaron Alejandrino, and I'm not going to say his whole full name, as you just heard, and uh, Steve Eckhart. And uh, these guys are very special to me. They're, uh, I guess you can say they're like beyond brothers. They're like friends. And uh, I wanted you guys here for a really special reason because you guys are equally as fucked up as I am. Uh, actually, I think maybe more. No, I think that's I'm debatable. That, that, is that is debatable. debatable. That is debatable. But anyway, uh, wanted to really spend some time with you guys. And if I had it my way, we would have Matt and Ray here as well. But but we don't. But we'll talk about them behind their backs. Really, the way you and I met, Steve, you own some gyms, two gyms in New York City, or not New York City, but in New York. Right. What are they called? Peak physique. Peak physique. About 45 minutes north of New York City. Group personal training. Yeah, boot camp. Weight boot loss, camp. boot camp boxing. Yeah. And, but now you live in California and you're running those two locations from, a, I mean, across the country. And they're doing well. And you, you and I started working together as a business coach and client. And we quickly became business partners in many ways. Um, and Aaron... You sent me a boot in the mail. Many of you don't know this, but I got this boot in the mail. I'm still waiting for the other shoe to drop, if you will. I don't really know when it's going to happen, but why don't you tell me the sequence of the, how the boot showed up? Because I know before the boot, there was edible arrangements that showed up to the HQ, even before I got to meet you. So we were in the process of looking for someone to run the supplement side of Fit Body Boot Camp. And I put up a thing in my stories on Instagram saying, hey, I'm looking for someone who can help me help oversee that department. And uh, you applied. How did it go from there? Man, from there, uh, he has following you on social media. And it was just totally happenstance. I think it was a Thursday. You put the post up on your story. And I thought, what the hell? I'm going to give it a shot. I had just sold my gym and timing was right. Um, I started the interview process, sent you my info, got a call with Bryce, uh, the VP. We really hit it off. We were like two kindred spirits on the phone. I think it was supposed to be a 20-minute interview. We talked for like an hour. Um, and then I really wanted to leave a good impression, so sent the edible arrangements, lined up an interview. I think I, I was living in Scottsdale at the time, so I planned to come out like the week later. Yeah. Um, quick turnaround. And then once I had uh, the interview lined up, I really wanted to leave that lasting impression, so I sent out a actual work boot in a box with my uh, resume, a visual resume of, mm -hmm. hey, I want to put my best foot forward. I think I'm a shoe-in for the position, and uh, I'm looking forward to uh, making the shoe drop. Yeah, that's right. Is that a fucking cool way of showing up or what, man? That was a very unique way of showing up. And I knew that I just, in that way, I was like, I want to meet this guy because there's something about him that, like, I would do that. I would do that because it's a way of getting attention. And it's just saying, look, man, I, I take life easy. I, I, 
I know there's a lot of hard shit happening and whether you get the position or not, it was like, hey, here's something fun, a fun way to show up. And of course, the rest is history. We hit it off. We went to, I think we went to Raw, you, me and Bryce. And during that lunch, I was like, I think this guy's it. And I was really actually looking for a problem to go, no, he's not it. But I really couldn't find a problem. So Bryce and I were like, I think, think he's it. And we made you an offer and here you are. But um, ironically, coaching client and someone who's going to work in our supplement department with us and be the lead there. And now you're the VP of Truly in our supplement line. And uh, But we have this like secret identity, the three of us. <laughs> and there's two other dudes that have a secret identity. It's almost like we have the main gig that we work on during the day. The day job. The day job. Batman at night. Your Batman suit at night. Yeah. yeah. Fuck shit up. It's like fuck shit fuck, up. Fucked up se- Batman though. 75 hours of fuck uppery. So, uh, Steve, how would you describe the project? Like, what is the project? Because you're one of the instructors. Before we dive deep into what you do, what is the project? How do you describe it to people? I describe it as something for men, people who men who know there's more than what they have to offer. They're not living to their full potential, and they know it. They just have been probably not admitting it for a long time. They've been covering it up, lying about it, totally covering it up, smothering it down, just keeping it compressed. And they know that deep inside, in, in a lot of areas of their life, that they're just being a bitch. Mm-hmm. But they know there's more in there somewhere, and those are the ones that we get to come to the project. They know that there's that beast in there, so we are going to assassinate the bitch and extract the beast and teach them how to be that beast that they need to be and how to call upon it when they need to. I'm curious, like, what makes you so qualified to be one of the instructors? Because that was that was me. That, I've been a bitch. I've been a bitch a long portion of my life, covering up things, deficiencies, not being a good leader, not being a good person, being, a, I call it the scumbag. That's what I call the earlier years of my life. When I give him a name, he's called the scumbag. Mm-hmm. And he, the scumbag was a bitch. He was a little bitch. He would cover up weaknesses, insecurities, and until I joined the, the Marine Corps is when I started to learn at least how to control that a little bit and flip the script and, and change the script of turning from the bitch to the beast. Did you voluntarily join the Marine Corps or were you encouraged? Well, our, United, our armed forces is all 100% volunteer. That's why we're the greatest armed forces in the world. But, but. <laughs> there is a but. A caveat. So years ago, they don't allow it anymore because... Apparently, they don't want people. I don't know why they wouldn't want more people like me in there. We did pretty well in that time. But basically, recruiters would hang out at the courthouses back in the, in the, in the late 90s, the 80s, all the way up to the late 90s. And apparently, maybe we messed it up for them because now they don't do that anymore. They would literally hang out at the courthouses. You'd come out of the courtroom, and the recruiters would be there waiting to talk to you. Hey, do you ever think about joining the military? Because they know you, have, you need a way out. So literally, it was one to three years in, in the state jail or four years in the Marine Corps. And I wasn't allowed... The judge wouldn't allow me to choose Army, Navy, or Air Force because, as he saw it, they were inferior. The only thing that would rehabilitate me was the Marine Corps because they're also a four-year contract, a minimum four-year contract. The others, can, you can do two years. So he wanted to make sure that I was going to get do my time one way or the other. Gotcha. And you did your time. And, uh, you know, we'll dive into how you're qualified and why you're so qualified. But I once made the mistake of calling you a, uh, a former Marine and you snapped, and you said what? I said, people have died for less. People have died for less. It's no such thing as a former Marine. Once we're a Marine, we're always a Marine. Yeah. From the second we become a Marine, we, we have to earn the title every single day, and that still goes on now. <laughs> every day when I wake up, I have to re-earn that title, or else then I, then I would be a former Marine. If I, if I accept that I'm a former Marine, it means I didn't live up to that title every single fucking day. So no such thing as a former Marine. That's powerful. That's powerful. Like, you live life to the fullest every single day now. Like, I see that. I live by the motto of... Bring the fucking fire every second of every second. Bring the fucking fire of every second of every second. I think we're starting to see a picture of why you might be qualified to be an instructor for the project. I'm not sure if qualified is the word. Maybe psychotic enough or fucked yeah. up enough maybe, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. it does take a special kind of fucked upism to, uh, to, to do what we do for 75 hours on these guys. Uh, but we do it to help them. Aaron, you... Uh, I don't even know how you and I got to talking about the project. Cause I think mm. you and I started to kind of birth the idea of the project. Do you happen to remember how we got to talking about it? I do, man. And I remember specifically that we were doing a uh, workout, tricep press down, and it opened up the conversation to the world we live in where you need literally an immersive experience to break out of bad habits. Okay. okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so after, after the workout, uh, I went home and I was talking to the lady and I was like, man, I think B is 
really, really on to something with everything he's doing with coaching, everything else. And I've been through these immersive experiences, but it misses the whole side of the physicality. I sent you uh, an email that night. <clears throat> and I said, uh, that's right. I said, I want to live in a world where two grown men can't relate on the fucked up shit, like getting molested. And I want to live in a world where literally our children are proud of their fathers rather than disappointed. And that opened the conversation. I think that was, uh, that, that was the first time that I kind of shared my experience with you mm -hmm. uh, about my upbringing and just how much your vocation, what you've done, your passion, your calling, literally stand on top of a mountaintop and say, my past was super fucked up, but I've turned it into a superpower. That is what attracted me to Fit Body Bootcamp as a whole. That's kind of what started the conversation. Here we are, five fucked up dudes that are changing lives through fitness, physicality, and the project. You know, it's funny because I do, now I, as you said that, I do remember that conversation and we started talking about how we were both, you know, I, I guess as adults, were byproduct of being molested. And it was one of those things where I think you told me a story like your mom yelled at you one of the times that it happened, like it was your fault, right? And I remember walking through life as a young boy, having shame, rage, and confusion. The shame was like, I can't believe this happened to me. Like, why, like, I, I can't tell anyone. Like, mm -hmm. this is so embarrassing. The confusion was like, did I do something to encourage this? Am I, even like, I remember thinking like, am I gay? Well, I don't think I'm gay. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't look at gay porn. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think I'm gay. But you're a kid and you're, so you're trying to process through this shit. And then, cause for me, it was two older boys who molested me. And then it was the rage. Like, how the fuck did this happen to me? Mm -hmm. How could this happen to me? Like who, who didn't protect me? Who? Who fucking slept on their responsibility in protecting me? Did you ever go through any of those emotions or was, was yours different? Fuck yeah. I mean, all, all those emotions. And I wasn't able to articulate for a really long period of time through most of my adolescence, early adulthood. And that turned into, you know, when you don't have a model of how to actually exhibit emotion and behavior as a young man growing up, I, you know, three very poor, emotionally developed father figures growing up. Um, not seeing how a man actually should process emotions and learning it only from a uh, a woman. My mom is a great woman, love her to death, but she hated every single man she was with. And that's a really poor example of how to grow up and be a man. Mm. Um, learning how to be a man from a woman that hates men is, uh, I mean, it, it's, a f it's a fucked up psychology right off the bat. So yes, the rage, confusion, the anger, the frustration that all existed for a really long period of time until I took responsibility for what happened. And that was the biggest shift. What was the, the shift point? Like, what was the caveat that was like, this is it, I'm going to do it? Yeah, I wish it was, uh, I wish I could say it was one moment, but it was probably a decade of recognizing that I was looking in the mirror, looking directly back at every father that, that raised me. You know, the lying, the manipulation, the stealing, the cheating, all the shit that I was really ashamed of that my dad had taught me. I was now practicing that behavior in some capacity. I was like, holy fuck. You know, I'm not only turning into the people that I resent, that I'm angry towards, I'm frustrated with. I'm not doing anything different about it. I'm literally just repeating the behavior. Yeah, yeah. It's like knowing that it's wrong and then repeating it and then literally suffering because of it, mm -hmm. being embarrassed by it. Because now, and, and I went through the same thing, and Steve, I'm curious if yours was anything similar, but I literally was like, man, I hope no one ever goes through that. I, I, I'm gonna be an honest person. I'm gonna be a good person. But then I had found ways to manipulate, manipulate girls in the gyms. I hope my wife doesn't listen to this. <laughs> um, I had found ways to manipulate chicks in the gym where it's like, hey, why don't we go out to my car for a moment? I'm going to show you something. And before you know it, I did show them something. <laughs> did show them something. I did show them something. But, but it was either that or... It wasn't or... as big of a barbell as they were looking for. <laughs> no, it wasn't. But I said, I got two inches more than you need, baby. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you this, man. Everything that I didn't want to be, I was, and I was uh, uh, ashamed of it. I was angry at myself for it. I would blame others about it, yet it was all my fault. And so there's a level of suffering that we do where we feel like hypocrites. Mm -hmm. We feel like this is who I want to be, but I'm acting like a scumbag instead. Um, now for me, my upbringing, my, my, my dad was physically abusive, but that's like every Armenian's dad was physical, physically abusive. That's just how it is. I, I, I didn't even know that was a problem until I came to school to, to the United States and the teacher in fourth grade is like, hey, listen, raise your hand if your parents hate you. And I'm like, Whoosh. and they called child protective services. They called my parents. And my dad very quickly in Armenian was like, hey, uh, you better explain to them that that was a mistake that you raised your hand. And I did. I said, you know what? I didn't know what I was raising my hand for. I'm so sorry. 
And then I got a fucking beating when we went home, like for fucking raising my hand. <laughs> yeah, right. And uh, like between that and being molested as a kid, coming to this uh, this country and being a, a foreigner and not speaking the language and being bullied and being picked on, um, and then getting involved in like just just home invasion robberies and then justifying it by I'm just a driver I'm not the guy inside the house my friends are inside the house and then being involved in a police helicopter chase and having this chip on my shoulder and there was so much anger that I was trying to channel towards other directions I never got into drugs or heavy alcohol but it was just a lot of violence um, and and law breaking for me um, what, what what path did you go down I think violence so, Every, every boy has it built into him, right? It's in our mm -hmm. DNA to be violent. We have aggression, we have testosterone. It starts from a young age. And if, you're mm -hmm. not, if it's not directed and channeled in the right way yep. from a kid, you're gonna be violent. So I was, it was the same thing. I was violent from, I was, from when I was a kid. It was, I loved violence. I mean, I still love it, but I know and I do it in a fun way. I call it fun. But with my, with my father, it's exactly, it's pretty similar, but the opposite. So I was never molested or anything like that, but I got, I would get to the point where I was like a ghost. So I was like, someone do something to me, beat me, molest me, do something. One time in high school, I was a senior in high school. I went back. I left something in the locker room. I, I would steal things and this and that, whatever, my whole life. Like, so I went back to do – I forget what I was going back for. And the principal called the cops because I was trespassing. He didn't even know I was a student in the school. Like, that's how much of a ghost wow. my entire life I was. And it was the fourth year of high school. He was calling the police for me trespassing. I was going to get shit out of my own locker. And he said, yeah, sure, whatever. He had no clue who I was because I was just a ghost. That's the way I lived my life mm. all the times, in the shadows, as a ghost. Because when it came to my father, we never, like I was with my son recently and we we're on the floor, playing on the floor and we're talking. He's like, who, did you ever do this with your dad? We were playing with Legos or something. I said, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, I'm like, you know what? I never once in my life sat on the floor and played anything with my father, ever, never one time. The only catch we ever had was him coming home drunk from work and throwing a steel toe boot at me and me having to dodge it. Right. So I got some good skills out of it. I got quick and I, I could, got a good crossover in basketball from <laughs> dodging the steel toe boots. But I realized I was just a fucking ghost my entire life. And that all the way from as far back as I can remember, all through high school, through into the streets after high school, into jail, until pretty much the Marine Corps. And whoa, whoa, I, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. How, how, do you, how do you end up in jail? Everything we just mentioned. I mean, robberies robbing drug dealers and selling their drugs, beating people up for no reason, beating people up for a dollar. Home, the, the one time that the judge made the final decision that this is what you're doing. And it was a house that was surrounded with, it was sick, sick shit, like homemade weapons, like the shit that I would create. I don't know if you wanna hear the details of it, but. Well, I had the anarchist cookbook. Oh, same here. Yeah? Oh, All yeah. right, so I, I was making fucking bombs that you could throw and fucking explode. Napalm, <laughs> yep. yeah. Yeah. I liked more face-to-face -face kind of stuff. I think it's a mace it's called. Yeah. And this took months to, months for me to make as a, as a teenager, months. A huge, if you want to know the details, a huge plumber's wrench yeah. attached to it was a baseball with big head, skinny nails, but a big head. So you had to put some super glue on it. And you can only do about three a day because it had to be facing up. Super glue it, put duct tape over each one like in a star so it hammers it down put some more glue like it took it was meticulous work but by the time it was done and a bunch of bandanas over it and ropes that tied around it so i'd have a wrench that would also was a weapon this is i don't know if this is what you wanted to hear but this is i guess, <laughs> this, is like, yeah. I guess this is the direction we're going with this, yeah, yeah, this yeah. We're looking for so literally it was a wrench with a spiked ball on the end that could be swung around so when the police that. saw that they said all right this is what you're doing <laughs> It was awesome. I want to make one. It was it was fucking awesome. I think I'm gonna make one again. You got me all excited about I think this huh. part of the project. Yeah, might yeah. carry that for the project. <laughs> yeah, you should. Keep you those should. motherfuckers in line. Yeah, yeah. I think a knife is so archaic. You should carry yeah, a mace. Thanks for weak. <laughs> yeah, you should carry it's a an mace. amateur hour with that shit. Um, so so it goes without without saying. I don't even remember what you're talking about. You got me all excited about yeah. that. It goes without saying that that we're, and I say this with the greatest compliment to us. We're pretty fucked up, and I like that. I believe that I have a special kind of respect for people that have suffered because they can do the most with the least. They've been alone for a long time, either alone physically, like a ghost in your case, or I can speak for myself, like alone up here. I've always been alone. There's been, truth be told, it wasn't until I started working with Kevin, my therapist, about four years ago, and I remember one time getting an argument with my wife. I'm like, I can give a fuck if this house burns down. You guys have seen my house, it's a beautiful home. If this house burns down, I wouldn't want you guys to burn down. I'd want you guys to be safe. But I feel like it's the three of you and me. 
And in fact, I ended up one day just sitting down and drawing a picture and it was like me over here on the side of the picture in black and gray. And then on this beautiful lawn and the wife and kids and the home there. Even though like we're a family unit, those are my kids. I always felt like I'm alone up here because of that. And we grew up as loners, whether you were molested or fucking abused and ignored and you just wanted something to happen just so you can have some kind of sensation of feeling. Give me a feeling, even if it's a bad feeling, right? Um, and, and so, you know, you get arrested. I've been arrested. Have you been arrested? Well, there's a similarity. How about that? Yeah. What, uh, what, what led, led to your arrest? Um, let's see. Two occasions. One was in high school. I uh, snuck out in the middle of the night and um, glued my previous teacher's door shut and his electrical box all closed and put some napalm, as we were talking about, anarchy cookbook, oh, yeah, on his driveway in a smiley face. That was one incident. And then uh, in college, um, I, I got into drugs. I really like cocaine and was very industrious and tried to find a way to support that habit. Um, so I had an intervention with my fraternity and it was go to rehab and get clean or, huh. or don't. So. Gotcha. Anyone have any traumatic events happen to them in life? Oh yeah. Yeah. Have you had one? Like a traumatic? traumatic not the whole life felt traumatic just yeah. by, <laughs> oh, like literally my best friend when I was a kid yeah. was the side of our house. That was my best friend. I'd have a, I'd play a nine inning baseball game against the side of the house. It would take me three hours. Every pitch, ball, strike, I'd have to catch it. If it went over my head, it was a home run. I'd keep score all my head at the side of a house. So to me, that's dramatic. My best friend was a fucking wall of a house. Yeah, yeah that is traumatic. <laughs> yeah, that explains your social skills today. But it's great because look how well it works for the I, project. I see it all as a blessing. I love it. I wouldn't change a fucking thing. I wouldn't change a fucking thing because that gave – we, we talk about it. We, we're taking what's happened to your adversity you've been in your life and turn it into a superpower. Fucking I see this hey. as a superpower. I could sit now, but in my head, I could sit alone in a hotel room when I'm traveling and in eight hours not have to worry. I don't have to go and do any sightseeing. I don't give a fuck about looking some rocks in Mexico or some bullshit like that or some bullshit in Egypt. I don't give a fuck. I could sit in a hotel room for eight hours and build a business in that because yeah. I could just lay. I'm used to that. I could be alone and just make shit happen. And it's nothing to me. It's fun to me. Yeah. Turn it into a superpower. Like we're talking about take it is. what has happened to you, turn it into a superpower. That is. I'll tell you this. I'm the king of diso disassociation, as, as Kevin said, which is I can just fucking go away, disappear, and it's just a physical body here. But, like, you could be fucking beating me up, emotionally fucking abusing me, fucking trying to keep me. It wouldn't matter. I'm gone. I'm mentally gone. And uh, my wife would hate that because we're arguing, and then all of a sudden, pff, I check out. I'm gone. And I realized that was something that, like, as Kevin called it, like, trauma that happened from being molested because you can't really run away. These two older boys got you, so I had to mentally check out. And that trauma led to the superpower of being able to just, no matter how shitty a situation is, if I have to get something done, whether it's work or, or a long drive, like I will get it done. I will just lock myself down just like you and get it done and disassociate from everything else, lock the whole world out, put everything else in the box mentally and focus on the one thing that I got to get done, which is a pretty massive superpower in this world of ADD and where people feel so distracted. Yeah, yeah. Um, any of your traumas give you superpowers, Aaron? Man, I got so many to pick from. Um, I'd say probably the most traumatic thing that, took, that had the biggest impact on me uh, in my freshman year of college, I got in a car accident and someone died as a result mm. of it. Um, Were you I, coked up? No, 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 no. This was, this was pre-drugs. This was before anything. That led to drugs later because I was sure. afraid of uh, Good coping asleep. tool, yeah, drugs? Good, yeah, good way to check out. Um, yeah, prior to that, though, I was um, – my mom was on her second marriage um, – and super toxic relationship, fighting all the time. This guy's, you know, for lack of a better word, a narcissist and a sociopath. Um, found out he was cheating on her for 12 years of the 14 years they were married, um, physically, mentally abusive, and just toxic at home. So when I went off to college, I was looking for my place, my identity. Martial arts had been my home, and I was running a couple schools in Phoenix and going to school in Tucson. They're about a 100-mile distance. Wow. So I was traveling four or five times a week between these three locations trying to do what everyone says you have to do, go to college, get a degree, you know, the next thing. And then I was also trying to fulfill my duties as a student inside of a teacher student relationship in martial arts and felt very obligated to that. Um, just confused and lost and didn't have a whole lot of direction at home and family. Just taxed Sunday afternoon, got in a car accident and someone died. And it was, it was my fault. Holy fuck. Um, 
How much guilt did you have for that? I, a lot. Yeah, I, I, a lot of guilt. And I didn't know how to process the emotion. I didn't know how to process the guilt, the shame, the frustration. Um, you know, one side it was, you know, it's a blessing that, I, that I'm alive. I got crawled out the window and I, so vivid. When something like that happens, it, it gets burned into your soul. I can still remember how it smells. It's, it's crazy. Um, but yeah, a lot of guilt and not having anything to really go back to. I went back to school because my parents were in a pretty toxic place and joined a fraternity the following semester, party like a rock star, got into drugs, alcohol, women. And that was the next year and a half before intervention and rehab. It's been a couple years sober after that. And then kind of a downward spiral for about five years mm. before actually waking up and getting my shit together. Um, but yeah, the, the superpower that developed from that is the recognition that if you're not paying attention, you're just going to spiral down and take other people's lives out with you. And it, it was a profound enough message to recognize that if I'm not fully in control of my life, that just the, uh, the aftermath from going through life, not paying attention, not being awake is very destructive. Ain't that the truth? Ain't that the truth? So the marriage that your mom was in at that point when you got into that car accident, was that the dad that had a whole other secret life and family on the other side of the country or is that a different one? Yep, that was the one. Uh, pilot, he's got a you know, dual identity. You know, and that shit. was, um, you know, the, the most frustrating thing about that is I think that was what I wanted to be the most promising father figure relationship. I, they got married when I was um, 12. And so it was just kind of, kind of coming into manhood. And he had, it was the first time that we had really experienced kind of money in our family too. So yeah. he had, he's, uh, you know, a pilot for uh, an airline. So we were moving to a whole other nice side of town. Uh, growing up, my mom, you know, worked two and three jobs. We had food stamps going up to just a lot of hard work because yeah. my dad was a deadbeat. And the dad after that was a, uh, a drug addict that ended up overdosing and dying. Sure. Um, so the stepdad at this point, I was looking for that father figure, that mentor. And just how he interacted, his level of self-awareness, his level of emotional maturity was just astounding, even for a 13-year-old to recognize. He would go in these fits of rage where he would just literally vibrate and shake when he was pissed off at something. And I couldn't comprehend what was going on. My mom was pissed off. She was angry. And there was just, just constant fighting and toxicity in the house all the time. And the frustrating thing was, you know, I was looking for guidance, for leadership. You know, a 13-year-old boy, they have no fucking idea what they're doing. You know, it's a transition time. I'm mentoring a kid right now um, in, in the neighborhood and taking him through a workout every Friday. He's 12 years old, raised by a single mom. And they're just so young. They're so impressionable. Yeah. And I remember looking back, I look back now, and there's just, he just fucked up. You know, and that's part of why I'm so passionate about the project. Because we're going to make an impact. We could have conversations that I wish I could have had when I was 12 years old. Yeah. You know what's funny about that is, <clears throat> and I'm, I'm pretty, I'm 100% sure none of your dads did this for you, and my dad didn't do it for me. My dad brought me to the United States, and I'm grateful for that forever. I could be a fucking taxi driver in Armenia in a communist country, um, you know, making fucking $8,000 a year, barely making it. But he risked his life and brought us here, but then it was, he was working so hard and he was so fucking angry that he had to work so hard. And, th you know, I think he might've underestimated how easy it was going to be. Uh, and he was in his forties when we came here, but, um, there was no rite of passage. There was no one ever taught me how to open doors for, for ladies. No one taught me how to be chivalrous. No one taught me how to work on a car. No one taught me what a weapon is or go play, let's go play sports. Um, I didn't even know anything about sports. Otherwise, I would have gone and played with the fucking wall, throwing a ball. And I was, you were saying this, I'm like, fuck, it makes sense. I could have just found a fucking wall. I knew a lot of walls. I'm just throwing a fucking ball against it, and I would have been my friend. And I would have done, but I didn't even know about sports. And um, so recently, my, my son's 14 now, Andrew. You guys know him. He turned 13 last year. And one of our project instructors, Matt Schneider, who has a very interesting story himself, his mom has been married eight times. And he goes, well, technically it's seven. And I said, Schneider, why, why seven? He goes, well, but, but I think it's eight. So is it eight or seven, man? He goes, well, I don't know, because she was married to the same guy twice. <laughs> she was married to the same guy twice, so I don't know if it's seven or eight. I said, let's just call it seven. And uh, each one of those dads were, one was just as fucked up as the other, just like yours. Um, so whether it's, you know, they were around, but they were neglectful, or they were around, but they were fucked up, 
and leaving all these fucking scars on us. We grow up to be men who are told to just go earn for your family and go figure it out. Um, just shut the fuck up and suck it up. And soon you begin to go, all right, well, I can, I can shut up. I can go earn. But behind the scenes, I'm going to fucking, there's going to be prostitutes. There's going to be fucking drugs. There's going to be alcohol. There's going to be gambling. Lie, when, cheat, steal, manipulate. Right. Yep. Lie, cheat, steal, manipulate. When you look at the last class of the project that we had go through here, we had we had guys in every one of those categories. Every category. Fuck Cheating, you. fucking gambling. And I'm not throwing any fucking rocks at them. Cheating, gambling, fucking alcohol, drugs, you name it. And you look at it was whether daddy issues or whether where their mom was fucked up and sociopathic. Um, but no one's helping these guys through. And then we decide that, hey, I know what I'll do. I'll find a chick who is going to probably be the surrogate mom that I'm, I was trying to attach to. Mm -hmm. And I'll have kids with her. And we start repeating the cycle. And I look at Schneider. So anyway, so I went to Schneider. And uh, at the time, he, he now lives in Southern California. But as you guys know, he was in Idaho and he had a kill house, which I thought was pretty fucking cool. He was a, he was a cop in Boise, Idaho or Meridian, Idaho. He then became a SWAT officer and then ended up quitting, quit being a cop and opened up, said to be an entrepreneur, opened up a kill house, which was just a shoot house that cops go in there and FBI agent, et cetera. And they practice how to clear rooms and stuff. And a mutual friend had introduced us and he's like, dude, why don't you come over here with Andrew and have a good time? I'm like, oh man, I just finished reading this book called Raising a Modern Day Night. Mm -hmm. And Raising a Modern Day Night was all about like how boys don't have real good mentors in their life. And women have this rite of passage because around 12, 13 years old, they start developing boobs and they develop, a, you know, they have menstrual cycle and that's, there's a visual physical change into womanhood. And the book talks about like men, or maybe it wasn't the book, maybe the, uh, the, the book led me to doing more research. And there was a whole program that I watched on, on YouTube where it talked about men have no physical cues. Yeah, okay, we'll grow some armpit hair, hormones, but I mean, hormones are feelings. You don't really see a physical change. And so men need some kind of rite of passage. So I'm like, I'm gonna use, use Matt's place as his place for a rite of passage, a kill house. And so we put Andrew through this high stress environment, took a handful of dudes over there, about nine dudes who I just trust and believe in, good guys. And uh, afterwards we all formed a circle around Andrew. And I was like, hey buddy, like you gotta have your own group of modern day nights that you can call your friends, your peers, who are gonna you know, live your core values, et cetera. And it was a powerful thing, man. Every one of these guys were crying. And here we are a couple years later, Matt calls me out of the blue and he's like, dude, I read your book and I think I wanna, I wanna come out there and work with you in California. I'm like, well, Matt, I don't know anything about kill houses. Like, do you wanna work in the franchise with me? He goes, I'll fucking do whatever. I just wanna be a part of what you're all about. And in my book, I talked about these uh, challenges that I put myself through, that I would just beat myself up physically, mentally, and emotionally. You know, I'd train for six weeks, run a marathon, train for six weeks with an MMA fighter, then we went in the ring together and he just pummeled me. Um, I was afraid of heights, so I was like, fuck it, I'm gonna hire uh, a, a climbing coach and we're gonna go climb fucking in Joshua Tree twice a week. I was afraid of the water because my dad had, you know, and this, this is the other thing, parents still these fucking unreasonable fears in us. Mm -hmm. And so my dad's brother in Armenia had drowned in a lake. And so we come to Southern California, I'm like, hey dad, I'm gonna go to the beach. Never go to the beach because if you go to the beach, you're gonna drown, your uncle drowned in a, in, in a lake. I'm like, all right, cool. So I start building all this resentment against him. So now I'm in my 30s, I'm like, well, fuck it. I wanna go in the water, I wanna to learn to surf. But I was so paralyzed by the idea of drowning. And so I hired a, a surf instructor and twice a week for six weeks went and learned to surf. Um, got pretty decent at it. And recently I even, I did a six week jujitsu challenge and um, just keep putting myself outside of these, my comfort zone. What that did for me is it taught me how much more I'm capable of emotionally, physically, mentally, and that like most people I would give up too early. And I don't want my son to grow up that way. So I started challenging him and things. And so he's in sports, he's going into jujitsu now. Uh, he comes in here, we lift together in the gym. But I share this with you guys because people start reaching out to me. They're like, hey, you should organize some challenge that you talk about in your book to put us men through so that we can start leveling up. I was like, I don't know how to beat you up physically, mentally, emotionally. And every time I would respond to a message like that, I go, man, you know, there's something there. 
But in that time, you were, you were already in my life, and then you had just gotten into my life, and we had that conversation where it's a shame that men have to relate on, dude, how were you abused? How was I abused? Oh, you were left alone? Oh, we were molested? Okay, got it, you know? Um, and all of a sudden, this past December, I meet Ray, who's a Navy SEAL, and then Matt's talking about coming out here and, and, and working with me on some capacity, and that kind of led to the five instructors of the project. And so when you think about it, you've got the Marine who's just fucked up as the day is long. <laughs> you've, you've got... Have you been listening to these stories? I might be the most fucking normal one here. <laughs> I always take the... I always take the <laughs> I'm always the fucked up one, but you hear more and more. I'm thinking, shit, I feel pretty fucking normal. I know, normal. I know you are. As I tell the story, you are. But here's what's crazy, and this is what I want the audience to know when you're watching this. As much as I'll pick on Steve, I think he's like the most normal here. And Aaron, you'll back me up on this. During the 75 hours of the project, uh, he, he like, you, you fucking black out and you're gone and you're just this sociopath that delivers the punishment. Ironically, at the 76th hour, when we're sitting at a at a table with those who graduated and were having dinner together they seem to like you the most yeah the feedback was resoundingly they must be as yeah. fucked up as I we think are so like is that the stockholm syndrome like the person that fucking beats them up the most or like i like this guy they were afraid that it wasn't really over they thought it was just yeah. a test that we were going to go back outside <laughs> for some more beatings i was i was like may, maybe the survey was wrong let's re-ask re him again I'm like no no we really like steve the most i'm like but he was punishing you to no end but it's it's exactly what they needed and you do your job really well um, and you look at ray uh, Navy SEAL, former Navy SEAL, and he he's an instructor for the project, doesn't talk to his mom. Mom was a complete sociopath, disassociated from his mom so that his wife and kids don't have to deal with her fucking toxic shit. Dad died, like was, in a, was, was drunk and died in some car accident. And then he was in a car accident where three of his best friends died. I don't know if he's told you guys that story. When he told me that, I hope he doesn't mind me sharing this. I'm sure he wouldn't. If he was on the couch, he'd probably share that. But he was like a teenager, man, and he wasn't driving the car. The driver died and the two people in the back, I think he was a passenger and he was the only one that survived. And he was just like, holy fuck. And he was just headed down this, this, this crime path. And it was, right, I'm gonna go do something that everyone says that you're a loser, you're just fucking trailer park trash. Uh, your, your dad's dead, your mom's nuts. It's like, fuck it, I'm gonna do the toughest thing I know. And he heard about the Navy SEALs and he decides to join the Navy and become a Navy SEAL. And he did, against all odds. Um, and you look at Schneider, who's just calm as the day is long, but you look at just this rage that he has within, which I just love, I love. And he can turn it on when he needs to. And the five of us together have put together this project. And I wanna talk about that in greater detail. Um, what do you guys say are some of the big breakthroughs that our candidates get when they go through the project? I think it's, and we never really came up. We were we talked about before. How did so? You have a fucked up father, right? He probably he had a fucked up father. He had a fucked up yeah. father. What causes a man to break the cycle? Like I had a fucked up father, and I know his father because he was still alive, and he was a, just as drunk as my father, just as abused. He was still at ninety something. He's talking to his sixty whatever something year old son. Tr like trash, like the same way my father talked to me yeah. my whole life. So what causes us to break the cycle? I think that's one of the breakthroughs is somehow we figured out how to help them break the cycle because otherwise mom's a crackhead, kid's going to be a crackhead, their kid's going to be a crackhead. Like eventually someone has to break the cycle. And all we came up with was that it's something in our DNA that causes that person in that lifeline to break the cycle with there's just a stubbornness in their DNA that some people can break the cycle and some people have to keep the cycle going. But I think we gave we helped them by us knowing how to break the cycle because we've all broken the cycle in our own families. Like my superpower from a shitty father was to learn how to be the best father ever. And I spend more time with my kid than anyone I know still running the business, all the work, as busy as I am. We hang out every day. I pick him up from school, take him to jiu-jitsu, hang out every single day for hours and hours. So what was it that caused us to break the cycle? So how, how we don't even really know, I don't think, what it is. It's a little bit different for each of us, though. I, I think a collision is literally what impacted uh, my ability to have the self-awareness to see that the path I was going down was completely different. You know, you put a whole new belief and story based on your upbringing that's allowed you to be one of the best dads I've ever seen in person. It's, it's, it's super rad. Um, I think each of us brings a very unique perspective, which allows us to have a completely different uh, identity to why we're doing what But we're how doing. did we get to that? Like, 
I know he's a great father. You're you want to mentor. You're mentoring a kid. Matt's an awesome father because our kids, our two kids, hang out all the time. What made us? I don't even know what the answer is. To that what made us break the cycle? But we know that it's possible, so we're mm. able to share that with the guys in the project and help them break the cycle. Otherwise, they're just going to keep their kids are going to be fucked up. Their kids are going to be fucked up. So somehow we brought it to them to break the cycle because we figured it out. Not even sure how we did. I don't know why that I said, okay, my father is a fucked up father, so that's going to make me be the best father instead of. I'm just going to be a fucked up father, right. a loser like him, and just be a drunk and a gambler and treat my kids like shit. Something told some chip on the shoulder that I think is in our DNA is some stubbornness that I don't know if we even have control over it made us break the cycle. So we just yeah. know it's possible. You know, we don't even know how, how it exactly happened. We can help other people break that cycle because we've done it and we know it's possible. One man can do it. Any man can do it. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you one person that comes to mind for me from the last class was uh, Big Mike. Mm -hmm. and he talked about how his dad, who had abandoned him, um, abandoned his mom and dad when he was just a <coughs> little puppy um, because of social media, found him and would periodically message him and kind of make him feel guilty. So Big Mike felt obligated almost to, well, I got to interact with him. He is my dad after all. And I remember we were talking, I don't know, we were probably 50, 55 hours into the 75 hours of the project. We were talking, we were doing that group ch chat, and um, I was like, dude, you do realize you don't have to talk to this guy. You don't have to respond to him, even if he talks about sports and you, he's trying to have something in common with you because he's trying to... All the, I, I caught what was happening. The dad was just trying to make himself feel better by saying, you know what, I'm making an attempt to talk to my kid who I had abandoned, and therefore I'm not a bad person after all. It was still a very selfish it move. It was all selfish, exactly. Yeah, yeah, it was a very selfish move. It wasn't like... I'm going to go apologize and, and then ask for forgiveness and then say, son, or, hey, dude, do you still want me in your life? Let him make the decision. Instead, he was trying to force himself into Big Mike's life so that he can say, I'm a good dude. With just all. a text message, too. What the yeah. fuck? A text message. Yeah, the anyway, weakest fucking way. A text message. Come on. Yeah, that's that's really making up for 40 years of fucked up yeah. and sending a text message. And and while we don't have to go to the, the details of the shit that Big Mike would do to sabotage his life, his marriage, his, his, his business, his kids... I said, you do realize, one, you don't have to talk to this guy anymore. Two, he's not, he goes, but he's my dad. I go, no, he's not, he's a sperm donor. Yeah. And those two words, he said, like changed everything for him. Because once you realize he's a sperm donor, that's, that's all he was. A dad is someone what you do. A dad is what I do. When we hang out, we fucking clean up their vomit. We clean up their fucking diarrhea when they're having explosions at both ends as babies. They come up, wake up crying with nightmares. It's, the, it's even beyond that. It's what you're doing right now living your life in personal development so you yeah. can be an example of who they're going to grow up to in the future. It's not just something you do in their adolescence up to age five, up to age 10. It's exactly. a lifelong journey. If you stop evolving and growing as a man and as a father, you lose the right to be a father. Right. You don't do it to a certain point. You do it to the day you fucking die. I mm -hmm. think that is one thing that, from my perspective, is I had dads for short periods of time, like where they were like really good in a short window and then just stopped. You know, growth is continuous. If you stop growing, you fucking die. Yeah, you and if you die. have, if you take on the responsibility of fatherhood, of being a husband, that's a lifelong fucking commitment. That means you get better to improve the life of somebody else. You know, and I always think about personal training. Everyone has started out as a personal trainer. Personal training led to personal development, to coaching, to business coaching. It's not just one avenue of personal training we went down. Right. We saw a problem within our clients that we we're like, I want to fix all of that problem. Yeah. which turned into a mirror for us. Like we want to fix everything about ourselves, not just one avenue, build a business and have a shitty fucking relationship with our kids. Like that's not being a fucking man. That's no. not being a knight. No, good point. Worse is, worse is when someone says, I have to babysit my kid. You ever hear a man mm. say that? You want to just fucking rip his throat out of his face or wherever the fuck his throat is. Like they say, I have to babysit my kid. It's your fucking kid. You're not a babysitter. Like yeah. you're getting paid to do it. Yeah. I've heard I've heard men say that. You I've think. heard that. And, and well, how about how about when we have to? That's a fucking privilege to be it with is. my kid, yeah. man. I'll, I fucking canceled speaking gigs to be able to hang out with my kids because I realized there's a, there's a choice I'm making here. And if I make the wrong choice, I'm literally sending a message to my son and daughter yes. that I picked this over that over you. And right? they will watch all of yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of what's learned is not just taught, it's caught. And your kids are always watching and they're recording. Like, what are you doing instead of what are you just telling them? Mm -hmm. and, and so that was one of the big big things I noticed in Big Mike was um, when he realized his dad was just a sperm donor. And literally, like two days later after the project was over, I think he sent a message to us and said, I blocked him. I told my wife to stop uh, to block him. 
I told him, sent him a message and said, hey, fuck off, you're not my dad. This guy who raised me was my dad. And uh, he felt no guilt about it anymore because this guy would guilt him into it. And no surprise, he started setting date nights with his yeah. wife because that pressure went he's away. Yeah. yeah, he's coaching his kids' sports teams. And what do you know, his business picked up mm -hmm. all because of that one weight that he was carrying that we gave him. Every time he would get that message, he would feel obligated to at least say yeah. something back. And then even if they didn't talk again, it's just digging in his head for days and weeks and months, yeah. just continuous until the next bullshit fake text message comes in. So it was just dragging him down in every area of his life, 24 hours a day from a stupid text message, like yep. block it, delete it, take out the trash. Can, can one of you explain what the benefit of the physical, mental, and emotional breakdown is that we deliver during the project? Mm. I think we both can. You want to kick it off? Sure. Yeah. I think it's the, the physical part, it starts with your mind, everything, when, when business. When we're helping a business owner, we tell the, I tell them, mind, your body, then your business. If you don't have your mind right, if you are not have the right mindset, it doesn't matter what you're going to do with your business. Then you have to have take care of your body the same way. Then you can start worrying about your business. If you just jump straight to the business, you're not going to be built. You're not going to be built for the future. You're not going to be durable enough for growing and scaling and the pressures of the business. So when it comes to elevating those, they need stress. They, everything builds like a muscle. Muscles build with adversity, with damaging it, with tearing it down. You build a muscle by breaking it down, building it back up. You build your brain, breaking it down, building it back up. You build your positivity, breaking it down, building it back up. And that's exactly what they need when they show up to the project. They need to be stripped down. Same thing we did in the Marine Corps, same thing they, the way we were trained there. You break you down and build you back up all the time. That's a, a, a fighting camp. That's what you're doing when you're, when you're training for a fight. They're breaking you down. You're getting your ass whooped. Your confidence sucks. And slowly, slowly, you're building it back up. You have to be broken down because you have all those fucked up things in your head from your past. They're just your way of doing it, your habits. They have to be stripped clean. We have 75 hours to do it, so we have to go to extreme measures to do it. Mm -hmm. So we're stripping them down so that we can build them back up. And it's amazing what we can do in 75 hours for them. Shit that takes years, would take years of just pussyfooting and little step at a time. Yeah. That relative. Took, took me years. Took me years because I didn't have a process for it. I just knew that I needed to suffer and I needed to constantly put myself against adversity because I knew that suffering was the way. And as I suffered, I would slowly chip away at the crop duster within me and make way for the fucking fighter jet to come out. Another way to say it is I would, I would fucking assassinate that, slowly choke out that bitch, and then, and then feed that beast. And you put a post on Instagram similar to that once about how you have to go through pain and struggle to succeed. And, and some fucking idiots in the comments were talking about, oh, you're making it seem like everyone has to struggle and everyone should look for pain. And the, but no, but it, it, look at almost all successful people in history. Look at them. Look at the shit they went through. Yep. Look how fucked up their lives were, how fucked up their parents were. They were home. Like how many millionaires and billionaires start off homeless, living in their car? You hear their stories. They're on stage speaking about it. That's what it takes. It, it, it takes pain to come out stronger on the other end of it. It yep. sounds like a bullshit, like cliche, but that's what it takes. Yeah. And I'll tell you this. One of the worst forms of abuse because someone who's watching this right now is like, well, I guess the project isn't for me because uh, I'm a guy, but I haven't been molested. I haven't been fucking uh, ignored and, and fucking a steel-toed boot thrown at me and, and you know, basically almost went to jail. And so uh, when, I, I don't need all that. I don't need all that. Well, let me tell you, being bubble wrapped your whole life and told that you're, you're the perfect little boy and that everything's okay and it's okay to quit and give up and be beta and be people pleasing and approval seeking and validation seeking. That makes you a little bitch in life because the moment, and there's a great book that you recommended to me that I read that, that now we have part of our reading material for the project uh, candidates. Um, oh fuck, what was that book? No more Mr. Nice Guy. Which one? No more Mr. Nice Guy. No more Mr. Nice Guy. No more Mr. Nice Guy. Like, what a great book. That'd be a good name for an autobiography for me, I think, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that would be your autobiography. That would be your autobiography. But let me tell you, someone's like, hey, you know, I grew up in a perfect family. There's no such thing as a perfect family because your perfect family probably kept the training wheels on for too long, let you out of the fucking things that you should have been held responsible for, bubble wrapped you for longer than you need to be bubble wrapped. And the reality is you don't know how to deal with society, adversity, and your approval seeking, validation seeking, and your suffering in silence anyway. It's just, thank God. And you, on top of that, they're lying about what, they, oh, I don't need that. But behind the scenes, they're fucking bullshitting their lying. Those people are more yeah. fucked up. Like when we were kids, the kids that went to Catholic school, I didn't go to Catholic, those are the most fucked up kids. They were like 
13 year old pregnant girls in Catholic school because that's the, they were in the, such a fucking bubble like you're talking about yeah. that they were just all fucked up. Well, the, the narrative too is that, well, men have lost the tribe as a whole. So men as a whole don't come together like this where confrontation and feedback are primary. What we do inside the project, feedback is a huge part of it. You fucked up, here's how you fucked up, here's the after action review, here's how to get better. Without that awareness, we go through life just thinking that everything we're doing is right. And if we've been bubble wrapped, passed down from our parents and generations and generations of you're the perfect son, you just go around not living to your potential. You have right. no idea or your your capacity. Or your also, does not be able to handle anything that comes your way. That they're going to get forbid, your business goes through crumble shit. under the yeah. pressure. They're going to. I will take. Leaves. I'll take the the prisoner who got out of prison and started his own business over the mommy and daddy's boy Ivy League educated. I'll mm -hmm. take that person every day of the week to run a bit to, to go into business with because they're going to be built for the, the battlefield of business. Like we talk about yeah. they're going to be built for that. Yeah, that's exactly right. You, you, know, you know, it's funny, too, because when you look at the, the the perfect little boy who grew up and he thinks he's God's gift to humanity, every time something goes wrong in his life, he doesn't he doesn't look in the mirror. He goes, well, Someone else's fault. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's, fault. it's my customer's fault. It's my employee's fault. It's my wife's mm -hmm. fault. My kids don't understand me. Uh, my business partner just doesn't get how much work I do for him. It's like, why don't you fucking own up and take responsibility for any of that stuff? And so those those people are even more damaged because they're not even self-aware enough to know something happened to me that shouldn't have happened to me, like molest, like beatings, like fucking neglect, like whatever, they're traumatizing me in such a fucked up way that I'm socially screwed up unless I fix myself. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the awareness that we have. Um, so I'm glad I went, we went through that abuse versus the abuse of being overly bubble wrapped and fucking told that I was a perfect little boy. Um, kind of shift gears on a, on a, on a little, little fun, fun note. Of all the evolutions that we that we administer during the 75 hours of the project, you guys have a favorite one that we administer? Mm. I don't know, we probably all the ones that we there. probably all the ones that we ne either never made it to the first zeros or one class because it was just two foot. Those are some of my favorite ones. Like when we sit around together, yeah. we go to dinner and we just start bouncing ideas off the shit that yeah. we come up with, the conversations yeah. we get into. That's my favorite part of the whole thing. That camaraderie we have of just yeah. like realizing how fucked up we were and the ideas we come up with. So things like that, that don't even make it to the, to the cut. Like when I used to do training, I would try things out in my basement, my parents' basement for personal training, some fucked up exercise thinking I want to be different. I would fall on the floor, crack my head in a weight, be like, Nope, can't do that one because I'm going to fucking kill Mrs. Jones. So kind of those are my favorite ones. Yeah. And my other favorite ones are probably ones we did that we're not doing again because they were too fucked up. So <laughs> we don't want to give away too many secrets. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Can, can you think of anything that, that really stood out to you, the um, evolution? You know, I can't think of anything in particular, but as a whole, what I like about it is just the pressure that we put on for the 75 hours. You, yeah. know, there's, you don't get to experience this anywhere else. No, no. You just don't. And, and to be able to test yourself, come out on the other end and survive and thrive and feel a part of a fraternity like that you earned, a brotherhood that is a bunch of adults that are in business trying to just dominate life. Like that's like nothing else. This isn't a, a college fraternity where you're we're guzzling beer. Yeah, and it's not a mud run. It's not a fucking no. Spartan race. This isn't that. I mean, this you're getting feedback on your business, on your mindset, on your relationship, on your mental, physical, emotional toughness. You're getting feedback directly on on from a fucking another man, who's yeah, another calling man that's, you that's out, running an empire. Yeah, that's served our country, that has been through this shit, been through the battle, and it's literally been formed right here in this room. Inside yeah. of BK Strength, we built this. Yeah. You know, this is, I think that's fucking cool. This evolution of what we've built is one of the coolest things. So the, the evolution that st stands out for me was uh, the second, the second um, Attack the Hill mm. that we did. So we have this really cool part where we, I'll just give this one piece away because you all have seen it on the videos anyway. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have it as B-roll in the footage here. But the guys are have their backpacks they've got the twig which is a 200 we call it a twig but it's a 200 pound piece of wood that's got rope handles on it and a whole bunch of metal bolts just perfectly angled to scratch your legs up and your neck up and your shoulders up sounds like a good time good time and they got to carry these things up hills and well in life we teach them that in life you got to attack the hills like once you see the fucking hardest part that's when you fucking go full speed and attack and up until then they pussyfoot around the fucking hills. They try and find their way around the hill. And maybe I can avoid the hill and find a longer route. Fuck that, attack the hill. And so as we did, I think at one point, <laughs> Steve, we rested at the top of the hill, the highest hill, and Steve encouraged him to take out their goggles. Well, he called them sunglasses. 
I don't, I don't know. You cannot confirm nor yeah, deny. No. I don't really know what you're talking about. Sorry, and, uh, so there's a dude named Jordan, you know, Jordan Thomas. He's a potato farmer. He's got eight kids, Mormon cat. Four foot three. Four foot three. I mean, the dude is, God bless me, shaped like a potato. He's got the heart of a fucking gorilla lion is what he's got. He's got the balls of a fucking dinosaur. Yeah. And <laughs> literally. In fact, he, he ended up being our honor man. Like, he was the top guy that top got the class. flag that we all signed, top of the class. There was a picture taken that Ed took here where uh, we're at the top of the fucking hill, and I guess on our way to the top of the hill, they put on their fucking scuba goggles that Steve so eloquently calls their sunglasses, and they were made to crawl up that hill. And at some point, he takes it off, and you could see the outline in mud. And I just put my arm, yeah, and, he, and I think he has it like hanging down on, on his chin. We were resting. And I put my arm around him. We took a picture, and the, I'm smiling taking the picture, and he could just see the exhaustion on his face. And after Ed snapped that picture, I turned to Jordan. I said, Jordan, do you think you want to ring the bell when we get to the bottom of the hill? And he goes, no, sir. And he just put his fucking goggles back on, and he was ready to fucking attack. Uh -huh. And I knew right then that guy had turned a corner, had turned a corner. Like, I, you could have put goggles up his fucking ass in that moment. That's what I told him. I told him if, what was the guy from, from the Peanuts, Pigpen? I told him if Elmer, <laughs> if Elmer Fudd fucked, fucked Pigpen in the ass and shit out a baby, that's what you would look like when he was standing there with that mud in his face. Mm. And he just didn't blink. And he, didn't, he didn't give a fuck. He wasn't at that point. Now he was already, he turned it. the corner here. He flipped the switch. He was, he, was, yeah. he was in it. He was one of us at that point already. Yeah. And he is crushing life now. Fucking He eight. is on a path to just pure domination. Fucking beast with eight kids. He's got no excuses. Mm -hmm. Someone has like one kid, like, oh, I got a kid. This guy's got eight kids. I imagine any given time, two of them, two of those kids are sick, throwing up, having diarrhea, have some fucking school function. The dude just keeps crushing life, business, his relationship, and everything. And to have his wife come to uh, the Empire Business Summit pulled me aside. He goes, thank you so much. He's never had any friends, and now he feels like he's part of a tribe. Yeah. It's like, holy shit, you're welcome. Like, thank you for sending this guy. Because I, honestly, I thought within hour number three, he was going to ring the bell and give up. You know, so let's talk about that for a moment. People pay a lot of money for the project for us to really support them, help them. And if they graduate, they're going to become part of this brotherhood where we have their backs for fucking life. But there's also a bell that we seem to constantly encourage them to ring and fucking leave. What's up with that? We don't want quitters in the brotherhood. It's as simple as that. You know, you want to make sure that whoever we invite into this experience, this opportunity, that they're with it for the long haul. And so we push to see whether or not that we're going to stick it around. That's it. So we had 12 in the last class participate and only 10 graduated to ring the bell. Do you think there was any others that you would have wanted to see ring the bell? In the first class? No. 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 Nope. No. Same here. Nope. The it, ten, ten it, graduated it what that should have. The ten graduated that should have graduated. The bell is there for a purpose. It's there for a way out. You need a way out. Yeah. They need a way out, and those are the ones we want. We want to push every single one of them to make them earn the right to not ring the bell. And the ones that break are not meant to be one yeah. of us anyway. And that yeah. bell represents so many things in life, so many commitments: your marriage, your commitment to yourself, your legacy, your business, your employees. Mm -hmm. And if they're going to ring it inside of a seventy-five hour experience, they're going to ring it somewhere else. You know, and that's just representational. One of the guys who rang the bell, <clears throat> it was, uh, you know, because you guys watching this, you might think, well, I bet you were beating them up physically so hard that they just fucking walked away from the exercise or evolution or fucking the beat up and went and rang the bell. Well, that happens in, in, in the fucking Navy SEAL program, and we did model it after that. Ray Kerr, who's a Navy SEAL and he's one of the instructors, kind of modeled, you know, we put these guys in boat crews, et cetera, and we modeled that exit out of that, the bell. But we were literally in here sitting on chairs, talking, but it, we, we create opportunities of confrontation and feedback. And I remember one of those guys who rang the bell, I think it was the second guy, because I don't remember either, because the time all warps together the 75 hours. It was the first time that he was gonna have to defend himself about a real cardinal mistake that he made. You know, I don't want to give a lot of things away here about the project because it'll ruin your experience when you come and go through it. And if you're a guy, you better be fucking applying to go through the project. But he knew exactly what the rules were for these, this specific evolution. There was three simple rules for this specific evolution. And he violated two of the three rules, and then he lied about it. And he threw a couple of his, his boat crew members under the bus and of course, we know all because we create the experience for them to lie, give them the opportunity to lie. 
And they did. And then we got the feedback and forced them to confront each other. And instead of apologizing to his boat crew and saying, guys, here's how I fucked up. I'm sorry. I should be a man of my word. And we accept my apology. He got up and fucking rang the bell. And that was in probably the 60th hour, 60 something yeah, hour. Just, that was he was late. on the home stretch. Yeah. That was late in the game. No one that rang, no one that rang the bell or that will ring the bell will ever be because it's too hard physically. Like no. they just, you, you, they're it's not going to do it because that it has nothing to do with nothing to do with that. Part of it, but it's not about the physicality. Yeah. Like the, if you show up and you're you're crushing it, Jordan Peterson, you know, exact or Jordan Thomas, a perfect example. Yeah. Guy's legs were shorter than everyone else's. Yep. He just worked harder. Worked harder. And that That's earned it. the respect. That's it. And, and, you know, you're, you're right about that because we talk about we break you down physically, mentally, and emotionally. When you look at the last two pieces, it actually breaks down that way. Only a third of it, only one third of it is physical. Mm -hmm. The rest is mental and emotional. And no one is ever going to ring the bell because I'm physically too tired, I can't go along anymore. It's that I'm mentally or emotionally drained and spent, mm -hmm. and I'm fucking mentally tapping out. And this is what we want to build is turn up your thermostat on your fucking level of pressure you can handle intensity you can deal with adversity you can fucking power through where mental and emotional toughness is concerned so we know that the project is for men entrepreneurs typically who are married um, works best you know if you're an entrepreneur because you're always trying to balance work and family and sometimes work has these fucking pressures, because what happens with business? We go, well, I'm gonna open up my gym, or I'm gonna open up my real estate firm, or my chiropractic office, or I'm gonna launch my coaching program. Mm -hmm. And we go, here's how it's gonna look. We marker board it out, and we go, here's how it's gonna look, here's how much it's gonna cost, and here's how people are gonna pay. I'm not thinking that the economy might crash, that it might take longer to get the permits, it might take longer to get the website up, it might take longer. We overestimate how awesome we're gonna be, and we underestimate how hard it's gonna, it's, gonna, it's gonna be and how long it's gonna take. And that pressure plus the pressure of the family, well, I thought this was gonna be successful. What the fuck, should you go get a job? You know, I could see a lot of wives, a lot of women saying that, and rightfully so. They just wanna fucking protect the nest. We've got babies. Are we gonna fucking put, up, put food on the table or not? If not, go get a fucking job. S stop spending money on this dead end fucking thing that you're doing. Then as a guy, you start building resentment towards her. You're like, you don't fucking support my dreams. And now you begin, and that's what I call the suffering in silence. You have this the anxiety, the fucking overwhelm. You're not sleeping at night. You have resentment towards your spouse, towards your fucking family. Uh, you let your health slip. You let your health slip. And before you know it, you're suffering in silence, white knuckling through life and looking for other avenues to get some level of fulfillment from because you're fucking numb. You're numb. And you don't even want to be with yourself. So you take it out on everybody else. And so we talk about how the project really focuses on the four F's, the F-bombs. You guys want to kind of go into detail what those four F's are and, and how they impact a, a man in his life? Yeah. It's, I think it's an equation more than anything. So you start out with your faith. It's a faith is a belief mindset that you can do or have and be something better than you currently are. Yep. Your fitness is the daily discipline that you literally have to put in the action committed to every single day. The only way you're going to change your physical frame is through a daily consistent discipline. Same thing with your business. Your family are the relationships around you. Who do you, what relationship do you need to strengthen in order for you to reach the goals that you're looking for? You can't just run a business and think that your kids and your wife are going to do it all on their own without the date night, without the investment into their own development. And then the finances, we all think about chasing the money, but the finances are a result of the work that we put in. Mm -hmm. If we don't put in the work with our faith, our fitness, and our family, the finances are always going to be empty. That bank account is always going to be drained. That's how I look at it. Faith, fitness family, finances, the four F-bombs. And when you have that squared away, it almost seems like your, your whole life is, is, is balanced. It's almost like a tune-up for your life. Do you think that a project is something that someone should go through over and over again? Or is it one of those things that once you go through, you figured it out and you, as long as you keep administering what you need to on your own life, you'll be squared away. How does this work? No, we all need, con like anything else, you need continuous training, continuous practice, continuous tune-ups all the time. Like everything he mentioned, all, all those four F-bombs, they need constant work, right? They're not just, we're not resolving world peace in, in 75 hours. We're going to change their life in 75 hours, but we still need to follow up with them. That's why we stay so tight knitted with them and we have the 90 day follow ups with them. And we're, that's an official 90 day follow up. We're in contact with them on a regular basis. Yeah, they're yeah. like, they're like our brothers. We're talking to them more than people we've known for 20 yeah, years. That's true. Like I went back to New York for the first time. I was, but since I moved here, I went back for a week and I didn't go visit 
any none of no one of my old friends or whatever you want to call them that people that I knew acquaintances is, didn't even know I was in town like people that didn't have relationship to my business I went instead to go visit one of the guys in the project uh, dreads who was had a wrestling match nice. in New Jersey having to be in town I said I'm not even going to contact these fucking people that I don't even want to have any social station with that I've known for 20 years 30 years I went to go I feel like I had a deeper connection with him just based off the project. Yeah, this is just the the doorway into the opportunity. You know, we've got the the Modern Day Night Academy, which is ongoing. We've got our alumni. We have all of 2020 laid out for our alumni meetups for our graduates of uh, the Project Evolutions, and then the, uh, the the Academy, which we're kicking off here not too long. But this is this is an opportunity to have the brotherhood that we're all looking for. You know, yeah. the the project experience as a whole is just to fucking get your eyes open. Yeah. You, know, you have to go through the project to really see all the areas you're deficient in. Once you're there on the other side, now we can build on it. Now we can really explode your business in a whole other capacity because you see what's not fucking working. But if you're showing up as a leader inside your business or you think you're being a leader inside your business but you suck and people are not responding, how else are you going to get that awareness unless other people come in and yeah. wake you the fuck up? Right. Do you think that – yeah, really. Do you think the people that are you're paying – are going to come to you and say, hey, boss, you're a you're big a fuck up. Yeah. You're a shitty leader. You don't know how to communicate. You're indecisive. Or your wife or your kids. Or your wife or your kids. Yeah. No, it's not going to happen. Your wife's going to tell it to you by serving a divorce exactly. fucking papers or cheating on you. That's how you're going to find out if, 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 if you're the spouse. And so this is the only place where that kind of feedback, brutal, honest feedback happens. And uh, I got to tell you, and it's fun as fuck. Like when I just think about all the, like I realize my life for the last eight years has just been a constant project, just fucking constantly putting myself under pressure where even a normal family hike like a couple sundays ago uh me, me and died texted the, the group here and we're like ray was in town and like hey guys we're going on a hike and it was the same hills that we attack no one showed up with just well we showed up with just us i did you did <laughs> yeah <laughs> and uh you show up with a weighted vest we had that that rig with the forty five yeah, pound plate got, attached yeah, to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. There was a fucking rig that someone had, Matt had, with a forty five pound plate, and the fucking metal rig just Damn. chokes out your fucking traps and your shoulders. And then there was the the Bulgarian sandbag that you mm -hmm. carry. Like we just show up with shit that's gonna like that hike alone is is kind of kind of strenuous, especially if you decide to attack the hills. And you had your kids with you, and I brought. Did I bring? I don't know. I didn't have my kids. No. Um, was Carter there? Yeah, I know there's a dog. Yeah, Carter was there, Matt's kid. Point of this is we don't even do a fucking leisurely family get together like leisurely. We fucking add elements that's going to stress us out, that's going to hurt. There was a sense of competitiveness. Ray, the Navy SEAL, is the shortest one of the group. And by far. His, yeah, by far. Yeah, his feet, he's like a duck underwater. Like his feet have to move twice as fast as everybody else's to move along. And I still wanted to make sure like he's going to be the one in the back. I'm going to make sure the shortest Navy SEAL is going to be in the back of, of that fucking family hike and not, not, not me or not anyone else. But it's that constant state of competitiveness of the stress that we put on ourselves that we show up with fucking 45 pound plates to, to, to do uphill hikes and fucking Bulgarian sandbags and weighted vests that will make things differently. And it was so cool to see that even though you and I specifically didn't show up with anything, we started doing the rotation. Like, all right, hey, man, let me carry that. Hey, let me carry this for you. And it was a really fucking fun experience. And before you know it, you've just, now all of a sudden you take the vest off or you take the 45-pound plate off and you're floating up the hills. Yeah. And that's what this is all about. But to me, the, the biggest thing about that, sure, we did it. We had fun just because we are just sick. We show up with all kinds of weird shit to carry up a steep hill. The biggest thing about that was our kids are there, right? I have my two kids there. Matt had his kids yeah. there. If your kids are there, they, they would see the same thing. They see first the camaraderie. They see... Okay, this hill is already hard, but look, we're making it harder. They're making it harder and we do for fun, and, and making fun. It, and having yeah. fun while they're doing it. And then if it, if someone wanted to, they're passing it off, helping each other. They're, those kids are soaking this yeah. shit in from one hike. The lessons they're learning there are more Huge. than you're going to learn any day of the week in Huge school. By example. Huge. It's a role role model mindset we call it. leadership by action. Like they soak it in. They see what you're doing. They're going to emulate that more than me just tell them, oh, make things harder. And then I'm sitting at home on the couch and tell him to go play in the backyard by himself. No, he sees I'm going to show up to a hike. I'm going to bring a vest. I'm going to bring a knife, a flashlight. We're going to go prepared. We're going to be ready for anything. We're ready to take on the world. We're going to have fun while we're doing it. Yes. That's what they're seeing. That's what I got. That's what I got out of that. That's why I love doing shit like that. It's a lifetime of it. And it's a brotherhood of it so that they literally get to be brought up with the best possible examples. Yep. And, and you know, to, to that point, like on Saturdays and or Sundays, we choose a day and 
we fucking show up here and we do we just fucking do jujitsu together. The coach Pete, who put me through a six week challenge, was kind enough where we now we just meet up and we do jujitsu. I don't know if I would make the time to do that, but if I know we're going to do it as a group, we come here and we do it. And we're always pushing ourselves. And I'll tell you what, because. Now, if you're watching this, you're going to be like, oh, I get it. You guys are fucking superhuman and you guys are nuts. I can tell you this. I can't speak for them. I can tell you this about myself. Left up to me, I'd rather eat fucking cereal, sit on a couch and fucking watch TV. Stone. And, and yeah, get stoned and get fat. Like, that's me. Left up to me. I have to surround myself with fucking weirdos like you guys to constantly keep pushing myself. Like... You guys are literally functionary in my life. Like, I need you. I love you like brothers and friends, but I need you in my life. My wife is way fucking levels ahead of me by smarts, by intelligence, by emotional intelligence, thereby forcing me to level up as a human, right? Because I'm a fucking human animal. She's a human being, and I just come constantly chasing that human being. And, and I share this with you guys, because if you think we're, hey, man, we're just fucking extra evolved and fucking physical specimens, while I am... Um, <laughs> And I, I can tell you this, that every fucking day I would choose, now I don't, but left up to me, if all these dudes went away, I know that I would slowly slide back into mediocrity and I will never allow myself that. So I've become so vigilant and staying connected because look, if you were running the project every other month, there's no way I'm going to show up out of shape, deconditioned, and fucking whatever. Like, my knee hurts right now, my hip hurts, and I got a shoulder fucking problem. And in two weeks when we run the next class of the project, I'll be fucking flying up that hill faster than anyone because I just know I don't want to be the last guy up the hill because we've become competitive. I've never been competitive in my life, ever. No one's ever taught me to be in sports or be competitive. I've become competitive by surrounding myself with competitive people, and I love that. Anything to, to, to share about the project or just in general before we wrap this up, guys? Just more on what you're saying about how we show up as the instructors. The same way I said when we're showing up with our kids, it's the same way that the candidates are seeing that. They see how we're showing up. They see we're locked in. We're competitive. We're attacking the hills. We're doing everything. Everything has a purpose. We're going all out and everything. They're seeing the same thing. They need to be around that also. So, again, on the continuing, that's why we stay in contact with them. Because if we just left them, I'm sure if we didn't stay in contact with them, some of them would slip away. Yeah. If we weren't constantly staying on them, if we didn't have these other events and other programs that are going to be set up for them ongoing to go on forever. So it's exactly what you were saying is what they need, what our kids need is that that community, that camaraderie of men, of like-minded yes. fucking savages. That's that's really what it – men need to be around fucking savages. You need yeah. to be. It's just in our in our bones, in our DNA – and you feed off each other, and it makes every one of us better every single day. There's, there's nothing else like this. You know, this is not a, a, you know, mentorship. This is not a mastermind. This is not a, you know, boys club where we're going off the weekend and fucking around to Vegas. They're like, there's nothing like this for true self improvement. You need this level of violence. You need this level of tribe. You need this savagery that you just said. And the only way that you get it is from other men that have gone through it. This might even hurt some of our other side businesses, coaching businesses, whatever. But I see people, I'll talk to people about whatever, coaching clients or whatever, potential coaching clients. And after a couple of conversations, they don't need a fucking coaching client. They need the fucking project. They need the fucking project. Yeah. That's all they need. I could yeah. solve that for you in 75 fucking hours. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you don't need more fucking leads. You don't need to be a better mm -hmm. closer. You, ha you have leadership. Some, some of those people. They're just weak fucking people afraid of, afraid of taking feedback, afraid of someone criticizing them, afraid of fucking up, afraid of failing, afraid of being a leader, afraid of telling someone to do. Afraid of holding people accountable. That's half the time. I swear, I just think this person just needs the fucking project. That's all they need. It's funny you say that because you know this week, as you know, we're running the Fit Body University, which is people from the last month and two who have signed up to become a Fit Body Bootcamp franchise owner. They're at HQ for a week, and we're training them on how to run their Fit Body Bootcamp locations. I spoke this morning to the group, and one guy came up afterwards, and he wanted to take a picture, and we took a picture, and he goes, uh, you know, so I just really want to make sure, and I could just tell from his body language now. I could, I could, I could mm -hmm. smell. I could smell the former me. I could smell the beta. I can smell the desperateness. I could smell the low confidence. I can just, my senses are, I almost be, have become a predator uh, seeking out that fucking weakness. And he's, you know, I want to learn to be a better marketer and I'm going to be a better um, closer and, 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 and this, that, and the other. I'm like, hey, you know what? Can I ask you a question? Um, do you think you seek out approval for people just by the way you approached me and et cetera? He goes, yeah, I, I, I do. I, I go, do you think you'll, you tend to settle for mediocrity even though you know you're meant for more? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He goes, so do you think that personality is going to be able to run this franchise successfully? Or do you think that you might have some troubles 
yeah, I think I might have some troubles. So can I tell you about the project? Mm -hmm. And as I started telling him about it, he's just like shaking his head like, holy crap, you're speaking my language. There was no, like, like you said, there was no marketing, there was no sales strategy, there was no fucking systems that we could teach him that would give him the biggest breakthrough of being a fucking mental warrior, a fucking savage who knows that anything, whether it's a fitness franchise or a fucking launching himself to fucking to fucking Mars that he could accomplish once he has that mindset of a fucking warrior savage. And I think that's really what, what has been the greatest impact in seeing these guys. Uh, I'll finish off with this. We got, a, we got a letter in the mail from one of the guys from the last class from his wife. She said, you don't know this, but not only was our marriage about to end before he came out to the project, I was worried for his life. And as I kept reading the letter, and in between the lines, what I was reading is, like, the only reason I was with this guy was because I was afraid he was going to kill himself if I filed for the divorce. And now he's setting up date nights. He's fully present. He speaks his mind. He leads our family. And that's the guy I was looking for. Like, holy shit. Like, if you could resonate with this, if you're hearing what we're pitching here, I want you to reach out to us. I want you to click the link in the description box. Go to MDK, as in modern day night, mdkproject.com. And I want you to go there and I want you to apply, fill out the application. We'll get on the phone and talk to you. If we think that the project can help you, we will let you know exactly how it will help you and the big breakthroughs you will have. But there's no reason, man, for you to be alone, not be part of a brotherhood, a tribe that you belong to, to feel like a modern day knight, to be able to fucking learn to unfuck yourself and stop letting the little bitch ride shotgun in the car with you. But, you know, get that beast in there. Let the beast take over. Because when you do, you're going to dominate life. We'll see you later.